Each vote casted on election day will dictate the course of the next six years, a crucial and challenging term for the 17th President of the Philippines. Examining the candidate's platforms allows voters to determine whose priorities are most aligned with theirs. It is with this awareness that the Filipino electorate can enact change through their chosen head of state. Welcome to Forward 2022, the Presidential Candidates' Assembly, a platform where presidential candidates discuss their vision and plans of action for the next six years. This event is accredited by the Commission on Elections, in cooperation with our media partner, the ABS-CBN News Channel, and the student-led initiative, Atin ng Boto. We would also like to acknowledge our partner youth group organizations from different regions across the nation. Sulong Philippines, Institute for Nationalist Studies, Kalikasan Pablo, Kurit Bulawan, We the Youth Vote, Sinag Quezon Incorporated, UP Samahan Tungo sa Progresibong Administrasyon, Saber University Central Student Government, External Affairs Council of the ASMPH, Naga City Junior JCs, Autism Strong Philippines, and Zenith Philippines. We thank everyone who is watching the live stream on our digital platforms, and the other series of interviews of other presidential candidates will be posted on the Guidance Facebook page and YouTube channel at 6 p.m. Don't forget to use the hashtags Forward2022 and Blueprint2022 when posting about the interviews on your social media pages. I am Mira Desado from The Guidon, your host for today's interviews. The format of the interviews is as follows. Each round starts with the introduction of the agenda. The areas of national interest serve as umbrella topics for their respective points of action. There will be four rounds in total. After the introduction of the agenda, the candidate will be asked to answer moderator-curated questions to elaborate and substantiate their statements positions, and programs on the specific agenda. There will also be questions from invited youth group organizations for each round. With that, let us meet today's candidate. Today, we will be talking to Secretary Ernesto Corpus Abella. He was the Undersecretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and the former spokesperson of the incumbent President Rodrigo Duterte. Hello, Secretary. Hi. Um, thank you for gracing us with your time as well as your effort and willingness to be with us in today's interview. Entirely my pleasure. All right. And let us begin with the first round. Sure. The topic of the category is basic needs. You stated that the first priority for economic recovery would be agriculture. Given that you see this as vital for food security, how will it cushion the impact of the current administration's rice tarification law? Well, regarding the rice tarification law, I think that needs to be really revisited. Uh, for one, I believe that we should uh, engage in fair prices for rice. I mean, I've been talking with farmers and other consultants, and uh, right now, uh, palay, which is the unhusked price, is going for like 15 pesos and being sold outside for 35 to 45, which they feel is not fair to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we sort of uh, came upon a price, not sort of came, but we, there was a tentative price where, that, where the farmers themselves would find it a pretty fair price and that would be about 21 to 23. Mm -hmm. So, go, but going back, you asked about uh, the agri powerhouse, which is our centerpiece. We basically see that uh, it has, agriculture has been a neglected, uh, neglected industry. In fact, it seems to have experienced more than benign neglect. Uh, but so intentionally, we want to focus on it at, in order to be able to uh, generate the kind of uh, income that the people need, kind of food security. But also in the long term, we want to turn it into a mega industry so that we have a, an industry that we can actually be proud of instead of simply becoming the source of uh, unvalued materials. And by this conversation with the farmers, talking about fair prices for them, yes. you hope to boost our agricultural sector and make it a mega industry? Uh, that would be simply one, mm -hmm. simply one, because it, the whole industry itself is a, uh, is a complex, it's, a, it's basically an ecosystem 
of uh, in, from anywhere from education, research and development to manufacturing, to uh, post-harvest facilities, all the way to all the way even to uh, domestic tourism, ecotourism. So it's a whole ecosystem that is built around both agri, up, up around agriculture and another industry, which is digital, which you also want to push. We now proceed to the questions from our partner youth group organizations. The first question is from our partner youth group, Savior University Central Student Government, Office of the Vice President. Let's play the video. Assalamu alaikum and good day. I am Muner Ramos Dato, a Moro Filipino from Xavier University, Ateneo de Cagayan. Republic Act 8371, or the Indigenous Peoples' Rights of 1997, describes inclusion with regards to addressing the concerns of the Indigenous people in the country. Therefore, IP learners should be included and talks about inclusive education in the country. However, inclusive education is usually perceived as mainstream education, and although the government has made actions in uplifting the rights of the IP communities, it still has some ways to go in terms of indigenous education. My question is, if elected president, what will be your platform in ensuring a genuine inclusion of IP learners in the Philippine educational system, given that around 200 Lumet schools were closed by the Department of Education from 2016 to 2021? Uh, first and foremost, I think we need a deeper conversation with the IP representatives. I believe in the active participation of civil society. When I say civil society, I mean including uh, representatives from uh, IP, uh, IP, uh, the IP people, indig indigenous peoples. Now, having said that, we would like, for example, to find out exactly which and what part of education, the educational system, the educational uh, ecosystem, do they want to participate in? Because uh, from my own experience, it's very difficult. It's, it's, it's really rather silly to start giving them uh, perceived courses which we think, which government thinks is going to be the course for them. We need to hear from them specifically which parts. It's prob most probably, for example, some of them could go on into, let's say, university courses, but we also need to know which and where they would like to go, either vocational courses or alternative learning courses, whatever course. So there has to be first a conversation. Secondly, we need to be able to provide them, of course, with the, the right amount of uh, so, uh, right amount of support, scholarships, even vouchers. For example, they might want to study in a different school, maybe in a, in a school away, away from their own hometowns. So we might be able to provide them, for example, with the right kind of vouchers that so they could engage in the, for example, they might want to, they might become, they might become coming from Mindanao, but they want to study, let's say, engineering in Cebu. We, we prob most probably we could arrange something where they have vouchers so that they can actually access scholarships with, with excellent uh, institutions in, uh, in Cebu, for example. We begin with the first question for this round. In light of the rotating blackouts made necessary by a deficit in the supply of energy, what will be your energy policy and what primary energy resource do you plan to forward? Uh, first and foremost, we cannot immediately cut off our dependence on fossil fuel. But increasingly, we should be able to we should be able to uh, wean ourselves from this. And looking forward, we can look. Uh, we're looking at renewables. We're looking at, for example, wind, solar, and turbine, uh, which which should the demand uh, which which should be generated from maritime resources. Having said that, we also like we also see we positively positively that within the next 18 to 20 years we will be 40 to 60 percent dependent no longer on fossil fuel but on uh, renewables mm -hmm. and we would like to make that a priority now regarding renewables especially in Mindanao which is actually off grid mm -hmm. we could actually begin there what we would like to do is generate enough uh, enough uh, what do you call this enough uh, prototypes uh, for example, agri-prototypes, uh, energy prototypes working together. And one of the prototypes we'd like to talk, we'd like to uh, move is, a, for example, the local barangay grid, no? the local barang barangay power grid, where, they, for example, is a, a particular barangay can be freestanding and have generate its own renewable, renewable source of energy. And, uh, it, and if they do it well, and hopefully they do it well, they can actually sell they, they can sell part of what they produce to, uh, to other barangays if necessary or back to the national power grid. I would like to follow up lang, what is your stance on you know, nuclear energy among our sources of renewable energy 
given as the recent executive order signed by President Duterte on including nuclear energy in the country's energy matrix? Uh, actually, yeah, of course, it's been uh, brooded about, no? and uh, other really developed countries have engaged in that. However, I think I believe it's something that we can kick the can down the road for a while until we're able really to handle matters like that. Yeah, one of one of my concerns is that uh, it could, and of course, it's not necessary, but it could lead into uh, you know weaponizing nuclear uh, the, the uh, nuclear sources. And if you and if we do that, while well, from our perspective, for, for some hawkish perspectives, that would become a deterrent. It could also lead into, it could also drag us into a, you know, a, a more full-blown situation, which is not too far off, by the way, as recent events have, have, are proving. You know, although we want to maintain a sort of independence, but personally regarding nuclear, I would say let's build first on renewables and then kick the can, kick the can down the road and talk with the next administration to see if, they're, if we are already fully capable of being handled that. Given the pressing concerns of climate change and how the Philippines is one of the at-risk countries yes. to be affected by rising temperatures, right, right. how will you expedite the process of helping vulnerable community and species? Uh, that's that's very close to my heart, actually. We have, uh, like for example, one of you know, for, for, that comes under the third leg of our platform, which is a matatag na bayan. But the basically that's basically a strong and resilient uh, nation. When we talk about resilience, of course we talk about programs, we talk about activities, but the thing that really rings in my ear and I believe will resonate especially to our young people over here is the fact that uh, resilience is basically an attitude. It is an internal attitude which it, it, it springs forth, resilience springs forth from I would know what somebody has said, and con a confident national identity, a, 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 an identity that is compassionate for its, own, for its own people, for its own nation. Now, having said that, how, how do we generate this kind of compassion? How do we generate this kind of, uh, this kind of attitude that would be able to handle, for example, uh, natural disasters and, and resiliency? We, we, we are proposing to develop a, what we call a national volunteer corps. A national volunteer corps between ages 18 to 35 that would actually hand, that would handle several things: uh, number community building, also nation building, also uh, environmental issues. For example, part of the environment, uh, part of the environmental issues that we want to address is the immediate replanting of every province, uh, planting at least a million trees between 2022 and 2023. And because the clock is ticking, and uh, you know, there's about uh, there, uh, we, what we want to avoid is the tipping point. Well, not avoid, but at least delay the tipping point of the 12,000 parts per million of uh, the, of carbon particles in the atmosphere. Because we want to be able to we want to be able to mitigate the effects of those things. So one number one, replanting of uh, re plant, uh, planting of about at least a million trees, and also planting the mang uh, the coastlines with mangrove. So that we'll be able to address both the floods, uh, the uh, uh, weather, and of course the the typhoons, the typhoons that could easily hurt, uh, easily hurt our coastal communities. So, if ever in your administration, your uh, you plan to have the national volunteer corps to yes. address climate change. Well, this is uh, it is basically a symbol of how we would address it. There are of course a number of other things that we could do, but symbolically we want to involve civil society and especially the young. Uh, the, well, the mili not, they're not necessarily millions, even younger than millions. Yeah. As sea levels rise, Manila is among the cities in the world that are sinking at a fast rate. In rural and coastal communities, more intense heat waves and harsher uh, typhoons threaten the lives and livelihood of Filipino people. What concrete plans do you have to make sure that cities, specifically their infrastructure, urban and rural, are prepared to brace the impact of climate change in the coming years? Well, for one, I, first, it, it cannot be done within six years. Mm -hmm. These things, these items cannot be addressed yeah, just like that in six years. What, what we really need is a long-term vision. And what first we have to, first we, what we'd like to present is, in my, from, from coming from my perspective, uh, is to present a scenario for a hundred year rise of the Philippines. A hundred, the peaceful, the single Filipino, or the peaceful economic rise of the Philippines. Meaning to say, it is a, it is a, it is a, a 
a vision for what what the Philippines could be and what the Philippines needs to do in order to be able to achieve that. Among other things, it needs to be it needs continuity. So one of the things I know that this is slightly two steps uh, away from the environmental issue, but we need to be able to engage and make sure that uh, the next the following administrations are in consonance, are in alignment with the uh, with the with the environmental issues, and that they're able to accept the fact that whatever is started here needs to be continued in the next two or three administrations. Among other things, we want to be able to address again. Uh, the, for example, uh, I mentioned earlier that we, uh, the National Volunteer Corps is we want to be able to replant uh, all the coasts with. Uh, with mangroves, you know? And the other thing is, of course, to make sure that uh, uh, our, for example, uh, the, the, we need to revisit our, the, the illegal fishing, we need, to, uh, we need to make sure that all of these things are properly supervised and properly uh, carried out so that uh, the destruction of our sea life is uh, properly addressed. In, in, the other thing that's, you know, for example, we're already experiencing a lot of bleaching of our coral, coral resources and we need to be able to address that. So there has to be uh, what, what can be done. And the other thing is, of course, to be, uh, to be able to do a lot of community organizing and community work, in, uh, to be able to transfer a lot of those who are in vulnerable areas, to be able to bring them into uh, communities that are safe and, of course, again, engage also in the building of typhoon and uh, typhoon resistant, uh, what do you call this, uh, housing. So, uh, but so in other words, we need to be able to, we need to revisit and make and make scenarios um, and plan scenarios, which would be a uh, a partnership between private and public, uh, in terms of being able to build new communities, new and resilient and sustainable communities. That's where I come in from. And one of the areas that also require your uh, attention from the government is also the agricultural sector, which you mentioned. Yes, yes, this yes. This is related to the next question. From our partner youth group, Saber University, Central Student Government Office of the Vice President. Let's play the video. Mindanao is the food basket of the Philippines. The region supplies over 40% of the country's food requirements and it contributes to more than 30% of the national food trade. According to the Food and Fertilizer Technology Center of the Asian and Pacific region in 2018, one of the major issues that the agricultural sector is facing right now is the incomplete agrarian reform implementation. We would like to ask you what are your plans for this issue? You know, honestly, I think we should just condone the debts. You know, just, you know, just as long as they make sure as they use it for for agriculture, we would I would suggest that we condone the debt because but they've been waiting for 20, 30 years for those for, for to get their own property, and up to now they, they don't have it. They don't have the title to it. They can hardly use it. And these are tiny things, you know. I mean, if, what can you do with what two to five hectares? But if if they owned it, they could actually they could be, actually become part of a industrial scale industrial scale agriculture, or they could uh, middle uh, they could form cooperatives and become and become and, and form middle middle size uh, farm. Uh, um, or they could continue to be artisanal if they want to do so and create, for example, a lot of uh, organic, uh, organic, uh, organic products, organic vegetables. So basically, I think the basic problem is to make sure that they own the property, they own the land. And I, I, would, go by, I would go by condoning the debt and then you know, making sure that they're able to use it productively and profitably. All right. And that is then again in hopes to boost uh, GDP, the GDP or the activity of Mindanao, which you earlier mentioned. Yes, and, but not just actually GDP, to make sure that the people become happy with being farmers. The kids are leaving, their kids are leaving agriculture in droves, you know, They're, they'd rather be, well, call center agents or whatever, or work outside. But if, if, if they had a the future, they would actually, I, 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 we can see that they would actually involve themselves in agriculture again. We begin with the first question for this round. On the issue of terrorism and extrajudicial killings, your only response was to serve justice and to have an efficient justice system. In what concrete ways do you plan to solidify the nation's justice system? Well, basically, I go by what, uh, what's his name, uh, the Secretary of Justice said. 
you know, our justice system works. However, uh, if, however, you know, the way, the way our law works is that there must be a case filed, right? People must file cases. So, if people feel that they have been inordinately, inordinately uh, uh, sinned against, you know, I would, you know, this is where, uh, this is where our first platform kicks in. Number one, we want to be able to make sure that civil society works. I, 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 keep, I like using this, no? Uh, the governance in the Philippines is run by legislation and usually in partnership with uh, big business, you know, and, and uh, the partnership usually works to their advantage, their advantage. Now, uh, if, but when, when you say this, I mean, like, for example, properties, you know, property, uh, you know, uh, farmers lose a lot of properties and what happens is you get a lot of real estate development, which is where our economy is headed for mostly. But it, if it needs to be rebalanced, we need to be able to rebalance it by engaging civil society. And this is where civil, and this is where I believe the secret weapon of most Filipinos is actually. This is the the, the web, uh, you know, the the tool that could really serve, especially justice corruption and other social injustices. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the, the local government code, the local government code in, insists and emphasizes that 25% of local governance must stem from civil society. But it's not being watched, it's not being used, it's not out there. Why? Well, for a number of reasons. People who are in power tend to sort of shove it aside so that it's not fully used. But if people actually know what their power is, what their authority is, they, and they, mo and they uh, group themselves illegally, and, uh, uh, they group themselves, they could actually engage and file cases, they could actually look after law enforcement, they could actually engage. So basically I'm saying uh, justice is not just an executive, it's an executive department thing, it is a local government thing. And civil society is the key to that. However, Secretary Ernie, one of the threats to our, the civil society is actually the anti-terrorism law, which is actually my follow-up question. What is your current stance with this law, and what specific action steps do you have with regards to this issue? Well, I, you know, I believe that it, we, we, can, we need to continue with a, what they call a pambansang uh, usapa. Uh, we need a national conversation regarding this matter, and I believe uh, with, by when by. by by, for example, encouraging a conversation, a national conversation regarding the matter, we can actually address it. So again, I go back. It doesn't. Uh, we cannot. We can, but we should put more responsibility. We uh, we can uh, put the responsibility on the executive department, but I believe we need to engage the population so that uh, so that we can have a more decent, a more effective uh, way of addressing that matter. And adding on to this information is the threat with regards to our freedom of expression. And the question is from our partner youth group, UP Samahan Tungo sa Progresibong Administrasyon. Let's play the video. I am J.M. Dumandan of UP Samahan Tungo sa Progresibong Administrasyon from NCR Quezon City. My question for the candidates is, if ever you are elected as the next president, what are the measures that you will propose in order to swiftly address corruption within the government? And how can you ensure transparency and accountability within public service for the next administration? Okay, uh, technically what we want to do is within the first 100 days we want to review. We want to review of all the, uh, for example, of all the cases, of all the, of all the, for example, the situations, of all the intended corrections, for example, regarding certain agencies, we want a review of that, and to make sure, to ensure that, uh, uh, that well, and to again go back to the, the whole aspect of streamlines, you know, so that, for example, as soon as possible, uh, if there are contracts that are yet unfulfilled, it should be fulfilled within, uh, just as long as the, the contracting parties are able to provide their own to, to provide, uh, what do you call it, to provide the adequate, uh, the adequate support, supporting papers, the supporting data, they should be able to, they should be, receive their permits as soon as, as soon as possible. And then of course the other thing, they keep saying this, and it's, it's actually true, that uh, if there's lesser, if there's lesser contact between 
the public and the collecting agency, it will be it will be much easier. You know, uh, it will be much easier. We could re actually reduce corruption. But a quick review, and a quick review, and also quick justice, quick effective justice. For example, talaga kamale. I mean, talaga nalin siya. Talaga nga hindi na kamale kung talaga may ginawa masama. Ay dapat talaga ng masikaso yon. Now is your time for your final statement with the elections fast approaching. Why should the Filipino people vote for you as the next president of the Philippines? I believe the main thing that I bring is a vision for the people. Isang pananaw para sa bayang Pilipino. Where formerly it was just GDP, I believe we need four bottom lines. Number one, people's well-being. Number two, planetary, uh, planetary balance. Number three, of course, is a is a, is a healthy economy, and number four is purpose. What is the purpose of a nation? The purpose of a nation is to survive and thrive, but it must be able to thrive in a just, peaceful, and joyful way. So, may I, pwede ko bang ibigay sa inyo isang pananaw na isang Pilipinas, isang makatarungan, mapayapa, at masayang bayan. Pa, paano po mangyayari? Mangyayari lang po yan kung Sumali po tayo, lumahok po tayo. Huwag po natin inigay lahat sa balikat ng presidente, sa balikat ng eksekutibo. Sumali po tayo, makilahok po tayo sa paggawa at pagbuo ng bayan. At hindi lang po yan, ay kung pwede, gumawa tayo ng isang gobyerno na talatunin na narandaman. Na, na, kung pwede po sana, after six years, ay mawala na yung 12.5 million people na iyon, na gutom. Aside from that, kung pwede, gumawa tayo ng isang isang bayan na kung saan nakakatulog na maayos sa mga tao natin. Pagkatlo ay sana maibalik natin ang pagmamahal ng ating kababayan, lalo na po ng ating mga kabataan, na maibalik ang pagmamahal sa bayan. At maging tunay po yung sinasabing ng ating pambansaawit na bayang magili, lupang hinila, lupang pinili, pinili upang maging ilaw sa mga bayan. Kung maga, not only that, ay kung pwede sana yung ating bayan ay Tunay na magampanan natin sinasabing buhay ay langit sa piling ng bayang Pilipinas. So I encourage you, uh, the Filipino electorate, to think about our choices for the next six years. Let it be that our choice will help build a nation that is worthy of Filipinos and Filipinos worthy of the nation. And may I, may I, may I encourage you to think deeply about the vision that we have shared with you. And that at the end of the day, it's our choices are out of the wellspring of our hearts. Thank you very much. Blessings. And thank you, Secretary Ernie, for joining us in today's interviews. We would like to acknowledge the Commission on Elections and our media partner, the ABS-CBN News Channel, and the student-led initiative, Atid Ang Boto. We would also like to thank our partner youth group organizations, Sulong Philippines, Institute for Nationalist Studies, Kalikasan Pablo, Kurit Bulawan, We the Youth Vote, Sinag Quezon Incorporated, UP Samahan Tungo sa Progresibong Administrasyon, Saver University Central Student Government, External Affairs Council of the ASMPH, Naga City Junior JCs, Autism Strong Philippines, and Zenith Philippines. Now, Voters, it is your turn to fulfill your duty by exercising your right to vote. Their ideas and plans have been made clear today, and it is up to you to decide who will lead the country in the next six years. Your vote is for progress. Your leaders are for the future of the Philippines and beyond. This has been Forward 2022, the Presidential Candidates' Assembly. Once again, I am Mira Dosado from The Guidon, and on behalf of the Forward Deep, we thank you for your participation. Stay safe, vote wisely, at mabuhay ang kabataang Pilipino.